I appreciate the last phrase of that song, demands my soul, my life, my all. And that's not a Sinai demand, that's a, that's a Mount Zion demand. We're actually, the love of Christ constrains us. And that's as we survey it. I want to survey the cross from Galatians chapter 1 this, this evening. Galatians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. Amen. You know, there are a number of, of uh, revealed objectives mm -hmm. that God has told us in the scripture behind the giving of his son and the death of Christ Jesus. There are a no, number of things he's told us about what, what the objective of that death was as we look in the scriptures, and I'm going to give you a few of these tonight. For example, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26 and 27 he gave himself for this purpose, that he might sanctify and cleanse it, the church, with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Mm -hmm. That's why he died, so that that would happen. Romans 14, 9 says, To this end Christ both died, revived, or rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Amen. That's why. And he is that. He is Lord of the dead and the living. Proving that by being raised from the dead. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15 reveals this objective. The love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. That's why he died. Amen. So that we wouldn't live for ourselves because that was the problem. So he died so that we would live for him. And Galatians 1, 3 reveals an objective that he gave himself that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Now that, uh, that deliverance is more than just from like things of the world. It's from the way of the world. We are being delivered from the things of the world. We don't look to those things anymore. That, there's, there's a truth in that, but it's deeper than that. There is a certain characteristic to people whose portion is in this life the way they are. Mm -hmm. And you might put the heading over the whole thing and just say evil. Mm -hmm. All men whose portion in this life are essentially evil mm -hmm. in the way they conduct themselves. But we're not left to conjecture on this. God has told us in a very uh, concentrated section of Scripture, he's kind of opened up to us the character of evil as it works in men. And it's found in Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 through 18. And this is, in essence, what evil is. And the reason why I'm saying this is because if we're going to understand deliverance, we've got to understand what we've been delivered from. That's right. What does it really mean to be delivered from this present evil world? So what is evil in the first place? And this is, in fact, a good definition for evil. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. That's evil. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. Isn't that something? Unprofitableness is evil. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. So not only, not, not, not only doing evil is evil, but not doing good is evil. That's something. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used to seed. The poison of asp is under their lips. That's evil whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. That's evil. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Well, not just the shedding of blood, but to be so instant and ready to shed blood. It's like the violence that covered the earth in Noah's day. See, that was disheartening to God, to say the least. Destruction and misery are in their ways, not just this place, this time. It is the manner of their life to be destructive, and to create misery wherever they are. The way of peace have they not known. Not just peace, but the way of peace. These are, these are things that characterize the whole of life, not just one point in time. And to cap all that off, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, one thing that magnifies the cross of Christ and glorifies the God that sent him to die 
is when the objectives of God, as revealed in the scriptures about his death, are actually worked out in our lives. And it should be evident they're going to be the very opposite of everything he's mentioned right here. Amen. So I just want to just recount these things and show you the reverse has actually happened in our lives. It's being fulfilled, and that's magnifying. It's magnifying Christ. It's magnifying God, and God, and then I'm hoping to encourage us to excel in these things because they've already begun to show great fruit in, in many of us. There is none righteous, no, not one. That is true. That was once said of us. But now, the truth of the matter is, we've been made the righteousness of God in him. We are actually fashioned in righteousness. Isn't that good? In fact, the new man is said to be created in righteousness and true holiness. We've been fashioned in righteousness. That's good. He says, there is none that understand it. But the truth of the matter is, for those that are in Christ, the Son of, Gro the Son of God has come and given us an understanding. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but we are increasing in that understanding. Yeah. Amen. You have more understanding about Christ than you had when he first came to you, don't you? Mm -hmm. yeah. See, brother, and that's an evidence that the death of Christ was productive. Yeah. That's one evidence. Mm -hmm. it's, like the, mm -hmm. it's antithetical to evil when we understand God. And we know him, and we're increasing in knowledge. Here's another one. He says, there is none that seeketh after God. But now it's quite different, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We are encouraged to reckon ourselves to be in dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. Why are we to reckon that? Because that is what we are. Mm -hmm. We've been baptized into Christ Jesus, thus dead to the world. Dead to the things that we were once alive to, but that's not, only, that's not the only thing. We are now alive unto God. This is Christ is. Can you be married to the one, to the premier person that's alive to God and didn't you not be alive to God? This can't be. We are joined to Christ and thus we are alive to God. Mm -hmm. See? Amen. We actually alter our course, as we've said tonight, based on our consciousness of God. See? We do that. Brother, how can you give to God something that you don't do in the conscious awareness of God? But we do, don't we? We are living in constable awareness of God. Thus, brother, anything that you do in the awareness of God, you can give to God. You give, and we're doing that every day. We're giving back to God. And how about this? They're all gone out of the way, but the truth of the matter is we are told, make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. What does that presume? We're in the way. We're in the way. And now, brother, we're taking preventative measures to make sure we don't get turned out of the way. Right? Amen. We're on the way. That's good. That's good news. Brethren, all these things are pleasing to God, and they all glorify Christ who died to make these things possible. They are together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. But now we're laborers together with God. You're God's husbandry. You're God's building. Mm -hmm. God doesn't labor where it's not profitable, does he? So if you're God's building, that is an evident token to you that, in fact, you have become profitable. You are laboring together with God. How can you be more profitable than that? See, these are all wonderful deliverances from the world, aren't they? Here's another one. Their throats an open sepulcher with their tongues. They've used to seed the poison of asps is under their, lips, whose, under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. It's like evil rising up from within till it comes out. And whatever's in you is going to come out. I mean, you know that. Yeah. Whatever's in you is going to come out. I learned that from Brother Seth a long time ago, Seth Wilson. Ephesians 4, 15, but quite the contrary is true of us because we are speaking the truth in love. And it's evidenced by the fact that we are growing up into Christ in all things. The things we say are now profitable. It's not death that's coming out. It's life. Mm -hmm. It's life that's coming out. Hasn't that what's happened today? Huh? Don't you have a more jealous desire to seek the Lord and please the Lord and to know the things that are above? What's happened? Yeah. Life is what's coming out of us because it's been put in us, see? And rather than cursing and bitterness coming out of, out of us, we're actually saying things that are profitable for one another's faith. This is all in evidence, brother, that we are, in fact, delivered from this present evil world and its ways. A few more things. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, but... Seeing that you have purified your souls in obeying the truth of the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another fervently. With a pure heart, fervently. See, we have a genuine love. We're not pretentious about it. And now we're fervently seeking to show forth that love for one another. When you do that, 
When you love the brethren fervently, you magnify the death of Christ because he died to make that happen. Amen. He died to make that happen. See, brethren, this puts motivation in your efforts to do good. When you can see that what you're doing is magnifying Christ. See, whatever he has died to make us to be, for you to be that is to magnify the Christ that died. That's, that's what I want to say. The way of peace have they not known. But now how about this? Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. And he's doing that every day. Huh? You're not fainted in the efforts, have you? You're not fainted in your minds, have you? Why is that? It's because he's giving peace always. By all means. Amen. And in every circumstance. See? Giving you peace that settles the heart, keeps the mind. This is quite contrary, brethren, to the time when we live in when men's hearts are failing them for fear. Why is that? Because the way of peace they don't know. That's why. Amen. One last thing. There's no fear of God before their eyes. But, brethren, seeing that we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, mm -hmm. what should we do? Hmm? Mm -hmm. What should we do? We're going to have grace that we may serve God acceptably. And what is acceptable service to God? It is characterized by reverence. And godly fear. Amen. Godly fear. Mm -hmm. What we do, we do in the awareness of God, knowing that He is sovereign over all, knowing that He has created us. We are not coursing our we are not creating our own destiny. He is our creator. And He has set His King on His holy hill, and we are going to bow to Him. Yes. Whatever He wants, we're going to give to Him. Yes. Because He's more important than we are. Yes. See, all this is a form of Godly reverence. And you had that because you've been given grace. But none of that would have been possible had not Jesus died. Mm -hmm. So in all these things, brethren, we find ourselves, in fact, fulfilling this word of being delivered from this present evil world. And that is God's will. So let's be encouraged to pursue it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much.